I've got to know what's going on! Yeah! Prince is back, baby! Wait, this is all stuff that happened yesterday. Ha! 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 Lots of me, baby. I know what you're thinking. You're such a hog. No, not that. But you are probably asking, are we really covering Phineas and Ferb? And yes, we are. The next logical question would be, what does George Romero have to do with Phineas and Ferb? Believe it or not, he made a cameo in an episode. You got me shitting me! Not gonna lie, I wasn't very familiar with Phineas and Ferb prior to doing this, but after viewing this episode, I actually liked what I saw. That certainly did surprise me, but then it dawned on me that one of the co-creators was Jeff Swampy Marsh. He had previously worked on Rocco's Modern Life as a writer, which just blew my mind because that's one of my favorite cartoons of all time. Don't step on the white ones. Hot lava. Pineapples. Phineas and Ferb was created by Dan Povenmire and Jeff Swampy Marsh. The show's initial run was from August 17th, 2007 to June 12th, 2015. Phineas and Ferb is the story of two stepbrothers, Phineas, the one with the red hair, and Ferb, the one with the green hair and the British accent. The plot of the show revolves around the two of them doing wacky and dangerous experiments. While that's going on, their older sister Candace is trying to expose their experiments to their mother, which she fails at every time. Then there's also this weird side plot in each episode involving their pet platypus, Perry. I guess he's a secret agent battling the not-so-evil Dr. Heinz Doofenshmirtz. I don't understand this fucking platypus thing, like, at all. It is so confusing to me. Now, to be fair to the platypus thing, I've only seen this episode of Phineas and Ferb, so maybe there's backstory that I'm missing. But, on the other hand, I will say this about the platypus. Platypus? More like Borapus. Am I right? Boo! Boo! Aw, oh, come on! That joke worked in Billy Madison. You know, if you had done something like this 20 years ago, you'd be a king. What, are we too good for Billy Madison jokes now? Yes. We start the show with Phineas and Ferb working on their rubber machine. How awesome would it be to actually be a rubber ball? I'm in! Can we shoot Perry with it and bounce him around the backyard like a platyball? We are then introduced to their friends, Isabella, Buford, and Baljeet. This is where we get our first major gag. Hey, what's shaking, Bacon? You do realize that Bacon does not shake. Sir Francis Bacon? I stand corrected. Which they then bring up again here. Well, now mine are Bacon, apparently. Look, I'm shaking Bacon. You like that? It's a callback to something I didn't even hear. In your face, logic! In case you didn't know the story behind this joke, because seriously, why the hell would you? The reason they made this joke was because Francis Bacon died from pneumonia. He got pneumonia from standing outside trying to prove the idea you could use snow to preserve meat. Yeah, seriously. But that's the urban legend. He probably contracted pneumonia from his exposure on his journey to St. Albans. And now someone's gonna be like, well, what the hell is St. Albans? Well, that was the place that Sir Francis Bacon was going to when he stopped to do the chicken experiment. You know what? Nobody gives a shit. I don't know why I keep rambling on about this stupid crap. As far as the chicken experiment goes, it probably happened, but it probably didn't kill him. Probably. While we're on the subject of talking about Francis Bacon, it reminded me of something that happened to me in high school. Not me in particular, somebody that happened to be in my class. 
really, I was just a pedestrian. I didn't actually partake in what happened, and really what happened wasn't that big of a deal. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! I have no idea when I'll ever get a chance to talk about this, so why not waste the time right now? It was the 10th grade, and I was in my Western Civilization class. We were studying the Renaissance period, and in particular, we were talking about Francis Bacon. Now, we had a girl in class who we'll call Barb. I wouldn't say she was stupid, but she was STUPID! Look, I don't want to be mean, but school really wasn't her best subject. She was more into eating her own boogers and giving guys hand jobs in the back of cars. Now, before you go, oh, you're picking on somebody. We live in such a PC world, oh, boo-hoo. Listen, she was extremely popular. The booger eating shit happened in like the second grade. As far as the hand job thing, that was just what she was known for, I guess. Anyways, when the word Francis Bacon was uttered, one of the skater kids sitting by me blurted out, no Barb, Francis Bacon didn't invent bacon. What he didn't anticipate was that she would hear it. She slowly turned around and gave him the iciest look I have ever seen. And then she doesn't do anything. She just turns around and goes back to what she was doing. Meanwhile, we're all laughing at her because she looks like a fucking idiot. And that's the end of the story. What did it have to do with anything? Nothing. With that very long and unimportant tangent done, we head back to Phineas and Ferb who are doing what again? <laughs> ah, that's right, Boropus. You do realize that I'm going to get that over if it's the last thing I do. Ugh, do we really have to talk about Secret Agent Boropus? <laughs> Fine. I mean, I guess he's sort of central to the plot. Anywho, today is the unveiling of Danville's new water tower. Mayor Doofenshmirtz is going to be dedicating it tonight at his press conference. We're fairly certain that Doof will attempt to disrupt the event in some way. Not only is it high profile, but since it's right next door to Doofenshmirtz Evil Incorporated, it's also extremely convenient. So get out there and stop him from doing whatever it is he's gonna do. We are thankfully whisked away from secret agent Boropus, and we are quickly introduced to Candace, her friend Stacy, and Vanessa, the daughter of Doofenshmirtz. I wonder if you and I will ever be this cool. What are you doing, Stacy? I'm trying to hook up this new super high-def intelligent multi-format home entertainment DVR system. Vanessa! Hey, Vanessa! Vanessa! Hey! Hey! Oh, hey, Candace. Yeah, I'm just buying some snacks. Some of the girls are coming over later for a movie night. Should be cool. Wow! Yeah, cool, what else? You wanna come? You know, let me just call my mom. I told her I'd get the squirrels out of the... Oh, oh, we're going now. Meanwhile, back at... Doofenshmirtz Evil Incorporated! We find ourselves back with Boropus and his plot involving people dancing to disco music. Boogie, baby. Woo, woo. My muscles out of muscle, but I can still shake my brick house or whatever the kids are calling it these days. I mean, disco. Really? I thought there was a plot in this show. Maybe we should get to the. Oh, we're going to? Well, what's the plot then? Behold, the Repulsinator! Whoever I hit with this innator will automatically become repulsive. And wouldn't you know it, my brother Roger is dedicating a new Danville water tower right below my ledge. If there is one thing that I've learned from doing this show, it's how to be cool about fire safety. Doofenshmirtz, on the other hand, needs a lesson, I think. The only trouble with it is that this particular innator requires a lot more power than any other innator I've created for some bizarre reason. And uh, I only have one functioning wall outlet in the lab. Man, that's not cool about fire safety. Tell them, guys! These wires are frayed, too many plugs in the wall. There's a fire gonna start, let's they take care of this all. Tell your parents to be cool about fire safety. Families need to know the rules about fire safety. And the inevitable happens, and the thing malfunctions. Uh oh I think it's overheated! When something's going to... That was purely coincidental. We know who's not going to be a... Deputy Fire Marshal! What does this raid do exactly? <laughs> oh, he's gonna be repulsive now! Oh, <laughs> So it makes everyone look like Doofenshmirtz, and it spreads like a zombie plague, 
except instead of biting, it's by just physical touch. Okay, no complaints here. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at... Doofenshmirtz Teenage Girl Movie Night! The girls are discussing at length what they're about to watch, a pretentious French film. So, I thought we could watch this foreign art film I found. Le Cour Noir de Delure et de la Tristesse Douce. Is that the one that's the neo-realistic portrayal of women's angst? No, that's the other one. This one is about on we. The thing that I find funny about this scene is I have had conversations that are exactly like this with other film snobs. A typical conversation usually involves someone trying to defend an M. Night Shyamalan movie, or some ass clown trying to convince you that Zack Snyder makes deep and thoughtful films. That's just a snapshot of the bullshit you tend to hear. For me, I usually get sucked into the conversations that devolve into a stupid argument about who would win a fight between Boba Fett and Jango Fett. To which I respond... Are you fucking kidding me? Meanwhile... Hit me with your mouth shot! <laughs> Oh crap, I forgot about Phineas and Ferb. Uh, what are they doing? Oh, the kids are now coated in rubber and it makes them bounce. Okay. This whole rubber plot makes you wonder how it's gonna figure in with the zombie, I mean Doofenshmirtz plague. I just got to make sure that those things never touch us. Stay back, you're infected. Hubert, put me down. I am okay, really. Why are you okay? Perhaps our rubberized skin might be acting as an insulator. Of course! The contagion must be transmitted by electrostatic charge! That's how. If you are confused as to what was going on, Dear Phineas here actually gives a pretty damn good explanation as to what's going on. What was that?! It's some kind of pharmacist! And if he touches you, you turn into a pharmacist too! And before anyone even suggests that I didn't see it, yes, I did see the floating baby head. Apparently, this is a reoccurring character in the Phineas and Ferb world. Okay, so I'm gonna just keep on trucking because none of this is making any sense to me. Let's bounce, guys! <laughs> Literally. And it's at this point that we finally reach our destination, George Romero's cameo. We now go live on the scene with our own action news reporter, Don Adedead. Don? Thanks, Gordon. I'm standing here in downtown Danville. It's an unbelievable scene. Pharmacists touching people who turn into pharmacists. Ah, here's one of them now. Mr. Mindless Repulsive Pharmacist, care to comment? Lots of me! And there you have it, folks. Lots of me! It's not a stretch to believe that I really like George Romero. I mean, romero Ween. But let's be honest with ourselves. This cameo was less than exciting. It makes you wonder, is this his preferred method of making cameos? Standing there holding a microphone? Does anybody remember Dead Eyes Open? Yeah, let's try to never speak about that movie again. My God. Let's leave George Romero behind and get back to the kids. Oh no! The pharmacist trashed the machine! Can we rebuild it? We can try, but we should do it inside. There's too many pharmacists out here. Our rubberization is fading fast. And then the other kids. So this is a French film subtitled in Spanish. There are two reasons that I shared this line. One, it's funny, and two, this is actually relevant to something that I do in real life. I actually watch movies in one language and then put subtitles in another. Now, if you're trying to rationalize this, the two questions that probably come to your mind first are, what is the point? And two, are you a sad human being? Well, the answers would be none and yes. You are stupid. Forget all the nonsense though, because let me tell you, you haven't lived until you've seen Groundhog Day in Portuguese. So, uh, você vem jantar comigo e com o Larry? Uh, no, obrigado. Eu já vi o Larry comer. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Mais uma vez, o povo desse país se reúne nessa pequena cidade, a oeste da Pensilvânia, e blá 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 blá. Não há como fazer esse inverno acabar. 
rejoining the kids, we see that their situation is looking pretty dire at the moment. I've got no boats left! I'm totally unprotected! We'll build another rubberization ray! Yes, it is not as if society has crumbled, Buford. The phone networks are still up. We still have electric power. And water is still flowing out the duct. After all this happens, Buford gets his moment to shine. Game over, man! We're doomed! That was for you, Bill Paxton. May you rest in peace. Is that not right, Isabella? Isabella? I, I thought she was... Didn't anyone... Who saw her last? Ah! Ah! Realizing that Isabella is missing, the kids come up with a plan to try to find her. Wait, wait, I bet she's at Fireside Girl Headquarters. We've got to go there. But that is all the way across town. We can't go out there unprotected. We're sitting ducks. Since our rubberization machine is toast, we're going to need some sort of insulating armor. Hey, Ferb, do we have any rubber lying around? Back on the street, we get to see our next cameo, and boy, is it a whopper. Don't touch me. I don't want to be a farmer's... Wait a second, that doesn't even make sense. You get touched by a pharmacist, you become a pharmacist. I mean, you can't just grow a lab coat. I don't know, perhaps the disease infects your clothing as well. Infects my c Are you insinuating that my clothes are alive? That's scarier than these pharmacists saying, Lots of me. No, I suppose I didn't really think that through. <laughs> Lots of me. Holy shingles, Batman, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost as their Shaun of the Dead characters. That's awesome. You want to talk about good cameos? This is a good cameo. This is way better than the George Romero cameo. This felt like a conversation that they would have had in Shaun of the Dead. By the way, do you like Nick Frost's shirt? No mention of the dick joke, but that might be asking a little much for a kid's show. It's just, Ed doesn't have too many friends. Can I get any of you cunts a drink? Meanwhile, back at... Doofusbert's Teenage Girl Movie Nights! Lots of Okay, something's weird here, because I know I only have one of those. Come on, Candace! Vanessa and her friends are stuck in her bedroom trying to figure out a way out of their predicament. Okay, guys, we gotta figure out a plan. We should totally split up. I'm gonna go hide in the bathroom where it's safe. I know. I'll run off to check out an obscure noise in the kitchen. I'm going to slowly walk backwards into a dimly lit room. Nothing like trying out those old horror movie cliches. I'm sure they'll fail miserably. Oh, I knew we shouldn't have split up. Lots of me. <gasps> ah! Yep, pretty much saw that coming. Phineas and Ferb's group finally arrive at the Girl Scout hideout. Upon arrival, they realize that Isabella is still missing until 10 seconds later when she pops her ass through a trap door in the floor. Now that the two groups are united, they decide that it's time to save the day. Luckily, Isabella didn't come alone. She brought a song with her. Roger, two fish friends we know is six feet and two inches tall. And the pin that hit him left a weird impression on that wall. So I took the angle from that point to where I knew he stood. And I found the building just like that because I understood. Triangulation, that's how I figured it out. To save the town, they're gonna use math. Okay. I mean, I would have gone the machine gun route, but let me tell you, it's still better than anything that ever happened in Dead Eyes Open. I find it ironic that Night of the Pharmacist, which is a zombie parody, is a million times better than the zombie homage, Dead Eyes Open. Hey, give me auch mal so ein Stück. Sag mal, ist noch ein Bier da? Oh, das ist cool. No, that's not surprising one bit. The kids make it to Doofenshmirtz hideout, but not before suffering casualties. Buford, you okay? I'm okay. You okay? I am fine. Ah! Ah! Me. Ah! 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 Me. Seeing Bulgy turn causes Buford to go nuts and remove his clothes? That's it! Buford, what are you doing? Look! I just lost my nerd. I'm not gonna lose the rest of my friends, too. But Buford, that's... Come on, you freaks! Fresh meat! Ah! Yes. yippee ki -yay, you pharmacist freaks! yippee ki -yay. Oh, gotcha, man. You know, he really could've been bait without taking his clothes off. Uh, yeah. I'm not really sure why he took his clothes off, but maybe he just wasn't in the right frame of mind. 
I don't know. Maybe it makes him more of a badass. It certainly worked for the Gauls. When they would fight the Romans, they would just take all their clothes off and run into battle naked. Okay, yeah, that's way too much information, and it has nothing to do with anything. The reason we're talking about this is the Die Hard reference. And anytime you reference Die Hard, that's a good day. Which then gets you wondering, is it a good day to Die Hard? Think about it. The 007 of Plainfield, New Jersey. Actually, let's never bring up that movie ever again. Buford's sacrifice ended up not helping very much. The kids are trapped and things are looking pretty bleak. That's when Ferb gets his moment to shine. Guess what? Any ideas? I got nothing. Ferb? I'm petrified beyond all capacity for rational thought. That one was for you, Harold Ramis. May you also rest in peace. The kids are rescued by Candace and Vanessa, and they make their way to the top of the building. Meanwhile, Borapus and Dr. Doofenshmirtz also arrive to the building. The two groups merge, and they come up with a plan that they hope will stop this whole Doofenshmirtz zombie plague. Well, that explains the electrostatic charge that's changing everybody, but we need some kind of conductor that neutralizes it. Well, water neutralizes static. Yes, water should change everyone back. Um, isn't that a bit of a leap? No, I'm a scientist. I'm gonna go with him on that. Yeah, but we've got to find a way to get everyone in Danville wet at once. Otherwise, the contagion could start again. Unfortunately, the water went out with the power, so we need to find a large supply of water, preferably elevated so that gravity can work in our favor. Yeah, I know. One, Ferb shoots the grappling hook, which attaches to the service platform of the water tower. Two, we send the vortex sprayer up the line. Three, we all ride up in the basket lift. Four, once we reach the tower, I'll climb into the top of the tank faster. and open the hatch. Five, Isabella will attach the connecting claw to the open hatch, which will move the vortex sprayer into place. Phineas, we can't hold them much longer. Whoever makes it to the vortex sprayer first presses that button to activate it. Everybody getting this so far? Yeah, that was a little convoluted, but whatever. So the plan is initiated, and almost immediately, people start to turn into doofenshmirtz. First, Candace, then, oh no, my favorite, Borapus. Next is Vanessa, which sets off doofenshmirtz, who loses it and also rips off his clothes. Dad? No, not Vanessa! <laughs> Lots of me? Freaks, fresh me! Yippee Kaye, you bobbins and freaks! Yippee Again with the clothes! I know, what's that all about? I'm not really sure what it is, but there's something extremely funny to me in the idea of someone stripping down to their underwear and throwing themselves at a horde of zombies. From now on, when anyone brings up zombie rules, this needs to be a rule that's included. I think that we should make this an official rule of zombiedom. The situation continues to be dire for our heroes, and the losses keep mounting. This time, it's Ferb. We're not gonna make it! No, you and Isabella will make it. Ferb, no! Ferb! Time is running out for the kids, and Isabella's is about to spill the beans to Phineas about her big secret. she got to tell him he didn't really get to reciprocate but better luck next time <laughs> yay isabella saves the day and our boys simon Pegg and nick frost make one more cameo where the hell is george romero seriously I still say this makes no sense at all. I know, right? And that, my dear viewers, was Night of the Living Pharmacist. This was by far the best thing involving Romero I have watched for romero -ween. The story was fun, it had great cameos, and I loved all the pop culture references. As I stated before, this wasn't Romero's best cameo, but who cares? The people who made this clearly loved Romero and all of his films. And I think that's a far better compliment than having a small little cameo that's completely forgettable. And I think that's about all I've got to say. So we're gonna wrap this up. Till next time. Aren't you forgetting something? Oh crap, that's right, the ending. I totally forgot the ending. Well, check it out. But whatever happened, it worked. Yes, everyone seems to be noticeably lab coat free. At least everyone within the walled city of Danville. Yeah, too bad about the rest of 
civilization. Seriously? I forgot the ending? The city is completely walled off and surrounded by zombies. Yeah, it's almost like a situation that could have happened in the movie Resident Evil. My name is Alice. I worked for the Umbrella Corporation. Oh, fuck. Well, I guess you know what's going to be next time. George Romero and his involvement with Resident Evil. This is a sad fucking story. It's a story with one or two ups, but mostly downs. And when we go down, I mean we go down. Down, down, down. All the way to the crappy Paul W.S. Anderson Resident Evil movies. My name is Alice. Would you shut the fuck up? So, till next time. Horror movies. Scary, but so unbelievable. Do we have any rubber lying around? Two steps ahead, as always.